just introduced myself in my Cree language. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Brady Highway, but uh, in my Cree language, my, my name is uh, uh, Little White Man Bird. And uh, my, I was given that name by, by my granny. Um, I'm a first generation half breed, eh? so um, uh, she, my granny wasn't able to speak any kind of English, and my mom was not able to speak any Cree, so, uh, you know, she needed a little little white man bird to sort of translate between the two of them. And, and so I often kind of joke, like, what kind of, what kind of white man bird is, like, what kind of bird is a white man bird? And, or if, uh, <laughs> are they talking about a, a little bird or a little white man? I can never really figure that one out. But, um, you know, uh, it's, a, it's important to introduce myself in my own language as well, too. Um, I'm from Treaty 10 territory. Uh, Pelican Arrows, I, it was uh, renamed from uh, the Narrows of Fear. Um, there we had, uh, had a great opportunity to, you know, to learn from my granny who was kind of introducing my, my mom to this great area. Um, but of course you needed, to, you needed to have that translation, otherwise my mom would not be able to, you know, have the same experience that, uh, that uh, other people enjoyed. And of course, you know, like, uh, there's all sorts of humor involved in this as well, too, you know, like, but uh, at the very crux of it, it's, a, it's kind of a safety issue. You want to make sure that you have good information going back between two different people. And, you know, my, my, my granny always used to, uh, to laugh because uh, she, she, had this, she had this arm injury, hey, when she was just a young girl. And so when she was uh, int introducing herself to my, my mom, who was a nurse at the time, she was kind of going like this. And, and um, I, you know, she was kind of talking about, hey, you know, she's talking about how much it hurts, eh? And then uh, my, my mom is kind of like wanting, okay, so Raymond, what, what's she saying to me? Well, you better look after my son or I'm going to take your arm and I'm going to snap it like that. <laughs> so, so, you know, translation can go both ways and so it's important. <laughs> It's important to make sure that we're, we're providing really good information to each other and, and it's, um, it's an obligation that I always kind of took very seriously, you know, uh, being, being, um, being a half-breed to make sure that, you know, everybody was safe and people understood what, what people were saying, you know, because it was, um, there was a lot of miscommunication growing up and, you know, I'm only, th I'm 39 years old right now and, and um, as, I, as I was introduced there, I started working with Parks Canada when I was 18. And, um, you know, in that corporate culture, in that Parks Canada culture, there was a lot of miscommunications. Um, I got picked up from a trail patrol there one day, and one of my colleagues said to me, you know, I've never met a real Indian before. And I thought, like, holy smokes, this is 1998. Um, we've got a long ways to go. And, you know, not to be too critical of Parks Canada, I mean, like, uh, we all have our growing pains. Um, people get sort of... You know, we, we all get kind of uh, crippled by our own systems. Um, you know, it's really hard to sort of move on as a group. You know, I understand that. But, you know, I've got to give them credit as well, too, that they're starting to move along. And they're a big part of the development of that ICE report that Scott Duguid was talking about here this morning. And, you know, if you ever get a chance to read that document, it's really important um, because it really kind of gives us a chance to be involved in conservation in a larger, a larger sense of the concept. Um, we were the original stewards of the land, and so it's, you know, as my partner Robert was pointing out there, um, our connection to the land is um, irreplaceable. Uh, once that resource is lost to you folks, it'll never be, never be brought back. Uh, so this is the kind of work that we're trying to do as well, too, that, you know, not only is it uh, restoration of our, of our cultures, after the residential school, it's also a restoration of our ecological systems out there that we're tackling. Uh, the two cannot be separated. And so I, I thought I'd share a story with you actually about uh, uh, something that's very sort of, it's relevant to what we're talking about here today. Um, it was a story that my uncle passed on to me. Um, he, was, uh, he was a Cree man from up north and he just passed away there last week. Uh, last week at the last year and about a couple months ago my son Sinjin and I attended his service and we spread his ashes there this summer so I, I like to keep the story alive to make sure that um, 
it, uh, that word gets out because it was a story that really inspired me to get in, to be involved in wildland fire and you know conservation in general. But well, as the as the story goes, it's um, <clears throat> there was uh, there was two brothers who were who were like a part of a small kind of a, a small band, eh? and between the two brothers, they would go out and they would be able to harvest food and it would, you know, they didn't really have to go too far to be able to sustain their, their community. And, you know, the approach was that they would, they would leave the community in a certain direction. And, you know, when the game started to get a little bit sparse or whatever like that, they would, they would pull back and then they would travel in a different direction. And they would move around the land like that quite, quite regularly. Eh? And, you know, um, there was these, sort of like what Robert was talking about, there's these boom and bust cycles, but I mean, like, they always respond, and so you could always count that you can come back to these areas, and there would be enough game for the community. But there was this one year where they went out to a certain direction, and as they moved out into that to that area, they noticed that there was a bunch of trees that had been cut down. They they had never seen trees cut down to the base like that before ever, and they wondered like what's going on here in this area, and so they kept on moving into that into that direction, and as they. Uh, as they find out, found out there really quick, there was a there was a settler community in front of there, and they had never seen settlers before. It was the first time that these people had ever seen the white man. And so they, you know, the curious, you know, they decided they were going to go and say hello. So they got closer to this community, and um, they noticed that as soon as they got closer, eh, they, you know, the they started screaming and yelling, and you know, there was all. It looked like the men started to chase them up the up the hill and so they thought okay well we better get out of here you know like this we're obviously not welcome and so they you know they retreated back to their communities and uh, as they were on their way back you know they they realized that these these people actually lit a big forest fire and uh, winds were taking that fire right towards those two boys and as they were running away you know like they knew that they were going to be overtaken but they kept on running because they, they wanted to save their community they ran as fast as they could until the, the moment when they realized that they were going to likely die from this fire. Um, at that point, you know, the younger brother said, like, let's get out of here, you know, like, we got to go away. And so he shapeshifted himself into an eagle and he was able to fly away. And then, um, you know, the older brother said, no, somebody's got to stay here and look after this place. And so he turned himself into a wolf and he came right back into that fire to try to put it out. And as the story goes, um, those two brothers continue to, you know, they're still brothers, but they're, they're there to look after the land. Uh, that story has a number of, you know, applications here in this setting particularly. Um, you know, not only was that a method of removing our communities from, our people from, you know, from different areas, um, we were forcibly removed from a lot of the a lot of the parks that uh, you know we consider as the most important spiritually you know charged places that we return to to harvest our foods and they're they're they're, they're gems they're even advertised as gems uh, but we need a permit to go in there you know like this is a method to actually take us out and uh, a lot of those methods were actually pretty violent so it's important for us to acknowledge that 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 practice was actually a, a like a pretty irregular it was a regular thing eh? You know, there's there's also, and I'll just skip across to this picture, but there's also the it's also the the um, the fact that it's two brothers speaking. And I, if, can you forward that for me, please? There's uh, there's also the fact that there's uh, like two brothers. I don't know if show of hands, how many people have brothers? Yeah, see, like yeah, I mean, when you're when you're a brother and you're sibling, like do you do you know? One thing that you know how to do really well is fight, eh? And so, like, you know, like, and so you have this this thing where you've got like an eagle, and a and a wolf on the ground, and then you've got this relationship that's that's already kind of separated. It's already volatile, you know. Like getting along with your siblings takes an art form as well, too. But you know, in a in a setting of in protected areas management, we always have these you know these system leaders, you know, like these. These people that have zoomed out perspectives, they're looking down at the land, 60,000 feet in the air, and they're saying, oh yeah, well, you know what these people need down here is this, and 
So they'll drop these ideas and they fly around. They've got handlers that'll actually say, hey, it's time to go, you know, like they're, they're busy, they're sort of high level thinkers. And then there's those of us that are on the ground, there's people in the weeds. And then to have the communication between the two levels is always really interesting. I don't know, you guys must know what I'm talking about, eh? Like what's, what's the difference between high level and low level? There's a way to communicate between each other, but we don't spend any much time doing that because, well, we're brothers. You know, and, and then we'll hash it out later, and it's, it's no way to communicate. And, you know, when, when you look at the state, of the state of what's going on in, you know, in terms of climate change and the types of impacts or the loss of biodiversity that we're experiencing across the world, we don't, you can't afford to, to be divided, to think one perspective is better than the other. Um, you know, certainly we can't be divided in terms of along racial lines. You know, coming from a province like Saskatchewan where, um, you know, the, the killing of Colton Bushi, for example, sent ripples all across our communities, you know, and, and uh, we found that the institutions were actually pretty tone deaf to actually w w what was happening to us, you know, like we were, we were t telling people that these are really important issues for us. And at the ground level, you know, like it doesn't matter what people are, are saying over top, you know, like this is what's important to our communities. And, uh, but you know, that message never gets heard. And then, you know, and now we're talking about reconciliation and then so the ego comes fly by and says, okay, here's a partnership for you and then shoves it right down. And, you know, like these partnerships, they need to make sense to the both ground level and higher level. And so I always wonder, you know, I see a document like, the, like that ICE report. I think, well, okay, well, this is, this is great that we finally got this initiative. There's, there's people talking about protecting what's important to our communities. And for us, it's protecting these in-ground cultural resources that are at Wanuskewin. Um, I work at a, at a small little park there where, you know, it's important for us to have partnerships on the ground because without them, we'd never be able to keep our doors open. Um, coming from the national park system, quite honestly, like I, I always took my budgets for granted. We always used to have, you know, X amount of money and I, you know, for, for my program, I, I was uh, involved in human wildlife conflict with polar bears and so I was just kind of watching people to make sure that they, you know, when they were taking their selfies with polar bears, it was quite a distance away, you know, and there was a gun involved. But, you know, like, so these are the kind of, there was always a balance between visitor experience and uh, resource <coughs> protection. But in this case right here, um, the, only, the only way that we could protect those resources to is, was to actually develop that, that valley. And um, I always, you know, we work with a number, of, a number of different partners, you know, whether they're um, university partners, provincial partners, municipals, uh, new municipalities. We've got, um, we've got a number of really positive relationships that we've developed over 25 years of working in this you know, in this environment there north of Saskatoon. And it's been really, uh, it's been really important, but we're not, just, we're not just giving away our traditional knowledge and just giving away our, our cultural resources in exchange for money. You know, there's a, going back, just stepping back, like just looking at it from a, just a little different perspective. Um, it is the spirit and intent of the treaties. What we're doing there is we're, we're sharing in this resource we're making sure that people are educated and we're able to protect what's important to us and we're finding different levers that are available to us that weren't available to us like 10 years ago. When I started with Parks Canada, um, the, the concepts and the content within that Indigenous circle of experts um, material would have just been like, it's just unthinkable that that stuff would have been, you know, brought forward in this day and age. Um, I've seen the progression in my short career. I've seen, you know, the tables turn and in fact, now, a lot of universities and a lot of, you know, a lot of institutions can't even get, um, you know, funding grants without some kind of indigenous, you know, indigenous perspective or some kind of in indigenous engagement. And it's, you know, uh, um, the Nature Fund, for example, you need, they need to have ties to some kind of a community. And, uh, you know, they're, they're stuck without those kind of partnerships. Um, you know, I would, I don't know what it's like in Alberta, to be honest, you know, like I kind of look at Alberta as being ahead of the curve in a lot of different ways. 
Um, I was fortunate enough to work in Yoho National Park and I've been to Wood Buffalo a bunch of times and actually I was just I was reflecting on what you were saying because I was involved in I was involved in a, like quite a large incident and I and I remember hearing I remember hearing about uh, them taking down your cabin and I'm sorry but it's important to actually you know be honest with each other you know like um, a lot of this stuff is actually it's a it's a these are personal things you, you know like I'm not going to tell you guys how to think. I'm not going to tell your institutions how to go about your business. But the, there's people like me on the ground that require supports from our leadership. We need partnerships that make sense to us. And there's a number of times when I've looked up and, and thought, you know, like, what is this person thinking about? Like, you know, and I've been on a lot of forest fires, and we see it all the time where there's a helicopter flying over top, and he's telling you to do something, and it's like, what are you thinking? You know, but, it, I, you know, but there's a way to communicate that back up, and there's a way that, and I and I'd imagine like a lot. I heard a lot of sort of high-level positions here in our introductions. There's a way to talk to people on the ground as well too, without inflaming an already delicate relationship. I wanted to move on to a little bit of uh, see. You know, perhaps one of the most unique parts of our park is. The fact that we've got a, an elders council, um, it's really nice to be able to, um, to come from like a Parks Canada where it's really kind of centrally uh, focused. There's a, a hierarchy, there's a, you know, you get your budgets and you get your objectives for the year and, and that's, how you, that's how you implement your program. And, uh, and then you get sort of evaluated based on how you, how you met their priorities. Uh, yeah, I want to scale in, you know, like if a partnership doesn't make sense to us, we just walk away from it. You know, if a, if a research proposal doesn't make sense to us, if it's, a, if it's like borderline mad science, we just won't engage. You know, like, the, you know, we, we're, not, we're not tied to any kind of political affiliations. In fact, we're just a, we're an apolitical site and we just, we just, we present our problems to the academic community. And we see if there's any bites. And so this, uh, this summer when I first started working there, um, one of the first tasks that I had was to, you know, restore grasslands, uh, three-quarter sections of grasslands, and then uh, to help facilitate the reintroduction of 50 bison to this area. Uh, it's not an easy feat, considering um, there are some pretty major environmental issues, including, you know, it's really intensive agriculture, um, uh, biosolids application every seven years. They had, uh, you know, I won't get into it, but I mean, there's just a number of challenges that we have to overcome. And it's really nice to be able to count on my elder council to say, you know, like, listen, we don't want any more biosolids. We don't want, no, 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 and there won't be any spraying of Roundup because this is against our indigenous laws. These are against our, our governing systems. And if we start messing around or bending the rules around the, the, you know, the use of Roundup, for example, then, uh, then where, where are we going to stop? And, um, you know, I always kind of, I take that, and I really appreciate that because um, we're trying to do good by the environment, and we don't want to sort of cut corners just to make sure that the bison have forage. We want to make sure that these, that the elders in this picture are actually going to be, um, their, their vision is actually implemented. And, uh, you know, it's just it's a great honor to go to work every morning and, and actually, you know, make sure that their vision is implemented. But also, you know, like taking the responsibility on to make sure that, you know, the research uh, community or, you know, whether it's our municipal planners or park planners, to keep them at bay as well, too, that, listen, this is not exactly what our elders were thinking about. Um, you know, that's really why I like that. Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas report so much because it, well, not only does it help tie our, our little park to a wider network of other sort of like-minded parks, such as, well, where, where is he, like, riding on stone? I forget, there he is. But it, you know, it helps us create that network of, of sort of like-minded parks, but it also truly reflects, like, what we are in terms of an organization. We're, uh, we're um, you know, we're an inclusive place. Um, Wanna is a gathering place, and so that's always something that we keep in the back of our minds to make sure that uh, we're um, we're not alienating anybody there, and we're we're genuinely using the best of both 
uh, traditional ecological knowledge and Western science to roll out this grassland restoration project and bring back the bison. Um, you know, uh, education is really where we focus. Um, we've got a number of, uh, so for example, we've got close to 40,000 visitors per, per year. Um, uh, our expansion, uh, some of our marketing research says that that's going to probably triple. Most of our, about two-thirds of our visitors are ages, you know, from K to 12. So we've get a, we get a lot of school trips, and so we're able to actually kind of tell people the story about how the place was established, and, you know, uh, some of our mandate and all, and all that sort of stuff. But it's really nice to be able to talk about pre-contact pre culture and the things that have been sort of lost to, you know, the way things are these these days. Um, you know, for example, uh, our, our land and water protectors, for example, you know, like when they go out to work, uh, they tend to get arrested. You know, it's really unfortunate because these people are, they're, you know, they're, they're passionate about what they do and like they, they recognize what's at stake. But without the tools and the training, um, you know, they, they have troubles doing their job effectively. You know, and, and it's really unfortunate that these people get thrown away like that. But it's, uh, we look at those people as the ones that we want to train. We want to be able to give them the, the tools and the equipment and the training to be able to do their jobs effectively and, and to actually counter some of, the, some of the science that is being told to us that, okay, okay it's, it's going to be low impact and, yeah, don't worry about mining in this area or don't worry about caribou in that area or, you know, it's only a little bit of uranium. We want to be able to counter that with our own studies and our own data collection and our own methods. We want to be able to publish those findings so that we're able to make sure that we're representing our communities in a good way and, and um, they're able to, to do their job a little more effectively. And so in that way, we kind of consider our, our park as being a bit of a learning beacon. And that concept is, again, talked about in that Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas document. Um, you know, we already have those uh, university relationships. You know, we've got an elders council. We've, we go about our daily operations with, real, with indigenous methodologies in mind. And it's, uh, it's, really, it's really inspiring to be a part of. You know, as, a, as somebody who is, um, who is brought up in northern Saskatchewan, I'm not a farmer. Like, I don't know anything about, you know, cattle gates and cattle squeezes and everything. You know, like, this is something that's just totally out of my out of my thinking, but um, we can all learn, we can all, f we can all adapt, and um, traditional ecological knowledge isn't something that's stuck in, in the past, it's something that's always evolving. And um, they're at Wanuskewa, and it's kind of, uh, it's kind of, it's great to be able to take the both, the best of both worlds, and uh, do the best we can by these, by these animals. Um, the only thing that I really wanted to, to really drive home, I guess, um, was the fact that, you know, it's, um, as, we, as we build capacity for our, for our small park, and uh, by small park, I mean it's like it's 450 hectares. Um, we'd, like to, we'd like to double in size, if not triple, but of course you need, you need partnerships to make that happen. You need revenue to come in. You need to be able to keep the doors open as well, too. And, for, as a non-governmental organization, we depend on the community to make sure, like if, if we're relevant in their minds, they'll, they'll put money towards us. And we were really lucky, the, the first slide there, that Thundering Ahead campaign, they were able to raise $40 million towards our project. So that really funded like this whole thing about, uh, you know, like the museum expansion. I think you, you might see some pictures coming up here in a little while, but, you know, we've, nine million dollars into a new museum exhibit that was that uh, seven nodes were really developed like the whole co concept was developed by our our elders council everything from the quotes to what's going to happen inside the display cases all that was provided to us by the by the elders but we're also using technology in a way to make sure that we're relevant in the eyes of some of the kids like this. You know, my son, he's looking at his phone right now, and I tell you, like, this is driving me nuts. Eh? <laughs> but, you know, like, it's, it's important to make sure that we, we understand where the world is going, you know. Um, uh, we just need to make sure that our, our knowledge systems are, are presented in a way to make sure that, like, our, our knowledge is still relevant in the eyes of our, our younger generation. 
And so whether we embrace technology for certain types of, you know, whether it's theaters or interactive displays or anything like that, it's, you know, this is the, this is the stuff that um, you're in charge of as well too. You know, like this is the work that you're gonna have to do. And honestly, like uh, I'm trained in Western science too. And like I had to fully admit it, we have a tough time communicating what's important to us. Um, you know, what our findings are, what it, you know, what it is. But uh, if you speak from the heart, it makes it a lot easier. You know, I can tell you that right now. Um, it's not, you know, you don't always have to go back to the graphs and, you know, all this stuff. I mean, uh, sometimes, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes you just need to take a risk and actually kind of get up in front of people and wear your heart on your sleeve. Because uh, I think we all kind of realize what's at stake here. And 17% um, isn't, a, isn't a huge lofty goal, but for whatever reason, we're having troubles hitting 17%. Like, why aren't we talking half? Um, it, it, makes me, uh, it makes me not only kind of like a little disappointed that this is the level we're talking about, but it also makes me excited in terms of like, you know, here, you know, uh, here we all are, we're, we're working together. I think we kind of understand the commonalities between, uh, between you know, what we're all trying to work for. And uh, not having a lot of experience in the Alberta system, but I, you know, um, I just think that it's important that as you build capacity in those parks that you manage, that the capacity spills over into the adjoining communities. Like, don't think of it as terms of training, and then think of that as sort of a lost time effort. You know, oh, we, we hired somebody, trained him for a month, and all of a sudden he's gone to work for X, Y, Z. That's not a bad thing. You know, particularly if you're in a if you're in a park that's that has employment issues, maybe there's some social issues, maybe you know whatever it is. Trust me, I come from Pelican Arrows, man. It's a pretty rough place there at times. So we're looking for for people to invest in in sustainable economies around our around our area, but to do it honestly. You know, like we don't want people to come in there and sort of dictate the terms of our of our existence, man. We've had enough of that. Um, we're really trying to find a way to work with each other, and um, it's really nice to at Wanuskewin to be able to, you know, to um, not only not only to be involved in a lot of this thing, but actually to kind of set our own terms. Like, if the university wants to work with us, then we have a we have our own objectives, and and in that way, we've actually been able to um, affect a research agenda. And I don't know you, you, you most of you folks in here are academics. Um, I don't know, have you, uh, have you had communities that were able to actually come in there and start setting their research agenda? Like, I, I highly doubt that. Um, you know, where, where the University of Saskatchewan is at is actually engaging with different communities and signing MOUs and, you know, these are research areas that we really wanted to focus on. Uh, in my experience, you know, uh, MOUs take all the momentum out of it. Um, you, want, you, want, you want a wolf pack on the ground with full momentum and you know recognize that you know that wolf pack is a family unit like when we go to work there I want to scale and this is like this is our second family and so we've we've we stand up for each other we make sure that we move forward together um, yeah I just wanted to make sure that I I made that point clear that um, as you build capacity for your parks and as your regions and whatever like think about it in terms of building capacity for the wider province Think about it in terms of building capacity for the country. Um, you know, how else are we going to do it? Um, you know, I just loved listening to Robert there a little while ago because he was talking about the realities of going out onto the land and actually doing this kind of work. What does it look like, you know? I remember, you know, I worked up in polar bear country and, you know, a lot of the Inuit voices, Cree voices, Dene, people were saying that there's, there are a lot of bears out there and it's becoming pretty dangerous. Um, but you know, like you have these conservation groups that are saying another thing, and uh, it becomes a little bit, a little bit difficult to be able to, you know, find out. Okay, so if there's direct con, if there's direct, um, you know, conflict or you know, if uh, contention, like if it's saying one thing or another, don't you think that's a pretty good uh, area to focus your research on? You know, like. I'm just giving you a hint here that, you know, anytime that there's a difference of views, um, it's pretty interesting to actually kind of dig into that from a research perspective. Um, 
How am I doing for time here? Okay, yeah, right on. Okay, well, I'll just leave it at that for sure. And, you know, the slideshow might go along a little bit further as, I don't know if there's any questions at all. Yeah. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just wondering uh, two things. What concrete examples do you do to create that space? And how do you know you're successful? Right. Okay, I'll give you an example here. Um, uh, I reckon, like through my visitor safety file, I recognized that there was a huge need for search and rescue capability uh, along the Churchill River estuary. I knew that it was a problem, I knew I had to address it somehow. Um, but I didn't want to wait for the first fatality to actually, you know, have it a, you know, have it blow up. And so, um, you know, I worked behind the scenes for about two years, and I was kind of, you know, saying, hey, you know, like the fire chief and different community people, like I said, you know, like there's there's opportunity here, particularly with the, you know, that ocean protection plan. That there was money available to communities that wanted to start their own search and rescue outfits. But it wasn't up to me as a government employee to say, hey, here's another pill for you to swallow. You know, like it was, you know, I had to be able to be a little more nimble and be able to take off and put on my hat and uh, be Brady or the safety guy. And you had to be able to, to navigate that pretty quickly, depending on who you're talking to. And you'd recognize body language and facial expressions pretty quickly because, um, you know, you, you knew right away that there was somebody who was who just thought, ah, oh, here we go again, here's another one trying to save the day. Um, you know, this went back and forth quite a, few, quite a few years. It was about two and a half years and there actually was a fatality on the river. Um, but it was, uh, it was at that time where the community kind of said, well, you know, what was that thing you were talking about? And, and then it was just a matter of saying, okay, what's our articles of incorporation? And we had training started within a couple months. And so, um, Really, for me, like from that government perspective, it would have been really easy to just institute it. Uh, but if we wanted 30 volunteers and if we wanted to train 10 instructors, then it has to be community-led. So, I mean, there, like I don't know what the numbers would have shook out to be, but we ended up with so many volunteers that we had to turn people away. Uh, to me, that's success. So, anyway. Uh, uh, did, did I answer? Yeah, that? yeah okay, yeah. yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you okay, no worries. Don't, don't be. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a roundabout question. I just want to thank you for sharing the victory story with us. Mm -hmm. Your two brothers and the people for the people. And in a way, my question is related to that. And what I'm really seeing in you is, and you talked about the importance of community. You know, it uh, it can it can get uh, it can get pretty heavy, you know, because you you know not only are you dealing with the the you know the issues behind the community and sort of all that historical violence that we've that we've received, but then there's also you know like a lot of people out there that just won't admit that it even happened. So I mean, like there's a you know at least at least in Saskatchewan after the after. Gerald Stanley got, you know, off for, for murder. Um, we recognized how wide that gap was. We actually, we, we were able to actually survey how far the distance was. All right, so, so the work is a little more than we expected, but at least we had a bearing on how far that was. And that's how I interpret it. It's really, it's really it can be really heavy at times and it can get, it can get to you. But at the same time, it's, uh, you have to have humor involved. 
you have to be able to keep you know your spirits high and um, you have to be able to take the risk sometimes you might say the wrong thing but at least if you're speaking from the heart you know nobody can really take take you down um, so that, I guess that would be my advice to just make sure that you're always speaking from the heart and and don't let it get the best of you you know I, I was listening to my buddy here there he was you know he's always joking around I mean that's how you do it I mean these are heavy subjects these are tough things and somebody somebody's got to do the work but um, you know who, who who's it gonna be and how are they gonna do it that's I look at I look at humor as being one of the one of the best weapons that we've got for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. Then again.